Good evening. My name is Mariah, and I am the Program Assistant for the Sustainable Energy and Environment Program. When it comes to stopping climate change, we're in a race against time, and right now, we're losing. From droughts to rising sea levels, unprecedented wildfires to rapidly intensifying hurricanes, extreme flooding to heat waves, the climate crisis is already here and affecting millions of people around the world. These climate exacerbated disasters are only projected to worsen in the years to come, and the impacts of the climate crisis won't be carried equally, as those least responsible and those already made vulnerable through poverty, racism, and war will be those who are most affected. I remember when I first learned about climate change. In 2007, after watching Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, I joined other students at my middle school in creating a human picture of the number 350, representing the, th the 350 parts per million of carbon that was then considered the major tipping point for climate change. We'd already passed it by that point, but I was, perhaps naively, hopeful that real change would happen in the coming years and we could stop the climate crisis in its tracks. I certainly didn't think that I would be faced with the reality of climate change just 10 years later. After graduating from college, I spent the summer of 2018 working as operations assistant at Grace Art Camp, an arts-focused day camp I'd attended since I was seven. That summer, the weeks of unusually high heat and smoke from the fires meant that we were forced into a choice of increasing campers' risk of heat stroke by keeping the windows closed all day and night even though we didn't have air conditioning, or exposing them to unhealthy levels of air pollution. Compared to the joy-filled recesses of my days as a camper, the kids that year were kept inside for recess or had to play on the hot blacktop with strict no running, no jump roping rules, nothing that would involve deeper, energetic breathing. Even before James Hansen raised the alarm about climate change in his 1988 congressional testimony, people have been organizing to stop the climate crisis. Over the last five years, I've had the privilege to join them as we've poured our dedication, passion, and love into our vision for a better world. We've written letters, testified at city council hearings, talked to our senators and representatives, submitted letters to the editor, mobilized our neighbors, canvassed for bills, turned out to vote, and more. And we've achieved some big wins. Communities across the Pacific Northwest have raised their voices against fossil fuel development, stopping over 16 proposed projects in the last decade. The Portland Clean Energy Fund, a ballot initiative led by and for communities of color, passed with overwhelming support in 2018 and puts millions of dollars towards clean energy and green jobs in the region. But we've also faced seen some immense inaction and resistance from corporations and governments. In Oregon, instead of taking action, our state legislature has been absent, literally, as Republican members fled the state instead of voting on carbon pricing legislation. The federal government, too, has been marked by inaction, as most climate legislation has failed to gain meaningful traction, or worse, we've seen a backtracking on past action, like withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement. And the crisis is getting worse around us. With the realities of virtual work under COVID, I've begun my year at FCNL, home in Portland, Oregon, where I could barely leave my house for nearly two weeks as we faced hazardous air quality from the fires burning around the state. As I sat at my desk, following updates about Senate energy legislation and planning our strategy for the coming year, I could still smell the smoke. Even as some promoted the rhetoric of climate denial, I was facing the reality of the climate crisis in apocalyptic terms just outside my window. Amidst all of the news and these experiences, it's easy, and sometimes tempting, to fall into a narrative of fatalism and hopelessness. But I find hope rooted in collective action and the strength of our community. This fall, I was deeply inspired by the way that the climate justice community in Portland came together to organize relief drives for those impacted by wildfires across the state. After launching a supply drive based out of the Oregon Sierra Club office, donations came pouring in. Sleeping bags, tents, toilet paper, food, and more were piled up to the ceiling as volunteers struggled to keep up with the sorting. 
In all, over the course of nine days, over 40 trucks and vans filled with supplies were sent to impacted communities across the state. When faced with our communities in crisis, staff and volunteers poured their energy into supporting each other. This community um, and their, our vision for a better future is what keeps me going. When progress seems far off, they inspire me. When we face setbacks, they are a comforting presence. And when we achieve wins, small or big, I'm thankful to be able to celebrate our joy together. As we face crises, from a global pandemic to the worsening impacts of climate change, it'll be communities like these that carry us through. And our ability to support each other through the climate crisis also makes us stronger advocates. Even though progress can be slow and the frustration can be real, I believe that meaningful change is possible and will be achieved through our organizing and raising our voices to all levels of government. And I'm thankful to be advocating for our vision of a better future, a vision of an earth restored, where justice is realized, where we can all live our fullest lives with my community by my side. Thank you.